what's going on everybody today we're going to be looking at the historical accuracy of trains and train robberies in red dead redemption 2. for help on this i reached out to the georgetown loop railroad and mining park up in georgetown colorado they put me in touch with their company historian a man named kevin wilcombe who's been a steam locomotive engineer for over 35 years let me begin by saying that the trains look and sound fantastic, and in my opinion, the inaccuracies don't detract one bit from the game. In my communications with the company historian, he identified numerous missing pipes, gauges, valves, you name it. In an effort to save some time, however, I won't go through all the minutia of incorrect components, but I'll still place the full list down in the description for those of you that would still like to know. Instead, I'll be focusing on a handful of the biggest historical oversights. Let's get started. First off, the coal space on the tender is far too large. On a horseshoe tender like these shown in the game, fuel was stored in the front half to third, depending on the builder of the tender, the rest was water storage. On that note, although train stations in Red Dead had water towers, they're never actually used in the game. In real life, steam locomotives took on water at every stop, which was necessary in running the boilers. No water, no steam. No steam, no juju. As for the locomotives, both are missing their front cab doors, which are shown as windows, not doors, in the game. Why they made them windows instead of doors, I do not know. Speaking of locomotives, engines that size would never be set up as a one-man operation. They always had a two-man crew. A steam locomotive requires both an engineer and a fireman. The engineer regulates the speed, the valves, and keeps a lookout, while a fireman puts the coal into the firebox. In this game, both trains lack a fireman, and the engineer does all the work. The company historian believes this setup is a concession to gameplay requirements rather than an oversight, and I tend to agree. On that note, there are no passenger cars connected to trains in Red Dead Online, but they do appear in story mode. Again, this is likely not an oversight, but more so that Rockstar may simply be waiting to add them in the game once they create an outlaw role. On the non-locomotive side of things, the company's story informed me that the switches and turnouts in Red Dead are just plain wrong. According to Kevin Wilcombe, quote, switches of that time were either handle or harp stands, not flopovers as seen in the game. The crossovers are too short and too tight to safely get a train through them. They appear to be missing their guide frogs and the general design of the switch points looks like it's trying to be both a stub switch and a point switch which never happened the bridle bars on the switch points also appear to be missing now let's move on to some other questions you're all probably likely wondering not at all as you can't purchase train tickets from Red Dead Online, at least at the time of making this video, I had to head on over to story mode to find some answers. So, in Red Dead Redemption 2, there are two major railroad lines. Each is only about 10 miles long. In story mode, ticket prices range from around $2 to $10. Historically, ticket prices average around 3.2 cents per mile. Since you can quickly do the math here, I don't really think I need to spend too much time explaining why these prices are not historically accurate. <laughs> Yes, they were. In the early 1890s, the economy tanked. Banks closed, businesses failed, and there were both labor troubles and mine closures. The railroads had overextended, forcing massive layoffs. Unemployment was as high as 50%. Jacob Coxey, an Ohio businessman, called for a march on Washington to demand jobs. Thousands responded. They became known as Coxey's Army, Coxeyites, Commonwealthers, or Industrials. In California, Charles T. Kelly started a similar movement, which he dubbed Kelly's Army. In Montana, it was William. Hogan who formed Hogan's army, not heroes. Others in the West followed suit. Instead of marching to Washington, these armies began seizing trains and commandeering them in order to drive across the country and take their complaints directly to DC. In the end, despite their best efforts, none even made it out of their home state. Nonetheless, several trains were stolen, and many Americans got a kick out of following the adventures of these, well, whatever you want to call them, disgruntled workers, bandits, etc. in the local papers. <laughs> In analyzing train robberies in Red Dead Redemption 2, we're obviously talking about story mode, as at the time of this filming, we still regrettably can't rob trains in Red Dead Online. In the open world of story mode, however, players can rob both passenger and express cars, and the way in which players carry these out is 100% historically accurate. Rockstar definitely did their homework here, so kudos to them. Additionally, there's even a train robbery mission as well, modeled very closely after Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch's Wilcox train holdup from 1889. Now, in the interest of avoiding mission spoilers, but still illustrate how incredibly accurate Red Dead's train robberies are, I thought I'd tell you a bit about train robbers in the Old West. Those of you that are experienced Red Dead train robbers will surely notice plenty of overlap. 
Historically, there appears to have been three ways to rob a train. You either rob the express car, similar to baggage cars, but carried high value freight. You rob the passengers, or you rob both. The express car contained the safe, so robbing it potentially brought the most amount of money. Of course, there were risks involved in doing so. First of all, the express car was always locked, so you had to get inside. Second, there was often one or more armed men in the express car, so you had to deal with that. Third, you had to get into the safe, which was easier said than done. According to an 1877 newspaper article about the famous Big Springs, Colorado train robbery, the train safe had a combination lock, which was only unlocked at each end of the Union Pacific Road. As such, quote, they, the robbers, did not touch it, as the messenger did not know the combination and could not therefore reveal the secret to them, notwithstanding their threatened demand. In such an event, some train robbers chose to blast the safe open with dynamite. Sometimes it worked, other times it didn't work so well, such as in the case of the Leeds, Missouri train robber in 1898, where the robbers used too much dynamite, causing all the money to be mutilated or completely destroyed. That said, many train robbers didn't even go for the safe, favoring instead to walk through the passenger cars and shake down travelers. I found an article in the Silver State newspaper in December of 1886, which explains how a typical robbery of this type went down. In this case, three robbers stopped the train, whereupon one of them drew their pistol and pulled the engineers and firemen off the train, then proceeded to rob them. According to the article, quote, while this was going on, the other two men went through the train. In this instance, one of the passengers, quote, notified the other passengers of what was going on and told them to secret their money. This they did in various ways, giving most of it and their diamonds to several ladies who were aboard. So most robbers wouldn't dare search a female passenger, about, quote, 12,000 in money and 4,000 worth of diamonds and other valuables were left by the robbers in their haste to get through the train and because they did not search ladies. So let this be a lesson to all you future Red Dead train robbers. You need to thoroughly search the ladies. Can we say that? In any case, these three robbers got away with, quote, the paltry sum of $105, three gold watches, 10 silver watches, five revolvers, and one gold ring. A bounty of $250 was placed on the head of each robber, though I could find no farther evidence of what became of them. What in the hell is that? Anyway, moving on. It's interesting to note that few train passengers ever fought back. Take, for instance, the same robbery. According to the article, a Mrs. Wittick of Carthage, Missouri, was, quote, greatly incensed at the proceedings and boldly stood up in the car and asked if 40 men were going to submit tamely to an outrage at the hands of two. And in case you're wondering, yeah, they didn't do anything. On the same train were also five soldiers of the 24th Infantry who were transporting two deserters. These soldiers were ordered by the railroad superintendent to quote, draw their revolvers and fight the robbers. But several of the passengers opposed this so strongly and pleaded so earnestly on behalf of the women and children on board that the superintendent reluctantly yielded and when the robbers reached the soldiers and demanded their weapons, they quietly gave them up. In case you're curious, I did find a handful of stories about passengers fighting back, but it must be said that this seems to have been exceptionally rare and often resulted in their death. Anyone willing to exchange lead with robbers had to consider the likelihood that innocent civilians would be killed in the crossfire. That fact alone probably explains why, historically, so few passengers, even if armed, resisted train robbers. On a final note pertaining to the ways in which trains were robbed, I also must mention that there appears to be a fourth way, which Jesse James used in robbing the Rock Island Line train west of Adair, Iowa, on July 21st, 1873. In this instance, James and his gang sabotaged the tracks in order to derail the train. Once crashed, they robbed both the passengers and the safe. My guess is that the death of the train engineer in the crash and the potential loss of additional innocent life likely explains why this method never became commonplace. Again, it depended on the methods used. After reading close to 100 newspaper articles from the late 1800s covering train robberies from across the United States, it appears that the average train robber secured about $500 from fleecing the passengers. Suffice it to say, you could expect significantly more money from robbing the express car. The biggest payout I came across occurred at Big Springs, Colorado in September of 1877, when Sam Bass and six other men held up a Union Pacific train, robbed the passengers, and according to the Helena Independent, secured $110 thousand dollars from the express car, equivalent today to a little over 3.6 million dollars. While modern historians believe that the amount may have actually been quite a bit less than that, somewhere around 60,000, the sum would still be equivalent to about two million dollars today. When Butch Cassidy and the Wild Bunch robbed the Great Northern Train near Wagner, Montana in 1901, they also stole 60,000. A train robbery in Seymour, Indiana netted 35,000, as did one in Muncie, Kansas. $30,000 was also taken by the notorious train robber 
robber Rube Burrow outside Benbrook, Texas, which interestingly was the second time he robbed the same train on the same bridge in 14 weeks. That guy's got balls or he's an idiot. Of course, not all train robberies brought tens of thousands of dollars. When Jesse James derailed the train in Iowa, his gang only netted $3,000. Not a bad haul at all, but far less than we might expect given the effort. Rube Burrow robbed at least 10 trains, averaging around $7,000 per robbery. But it should be noted that several of his holdups only brought him $1,000 to $2,000 apiece. The Fairbank train robbery in February of 1900 only fetched the robbers 17 Mexican pesos. All that said, a train robber targeting the express car in its safe could still likely expect a minimum payout of about $2,000 and an average payout closer to $7,000. Now before I wrap up, I got a little bonus history for you here. In scouring the archives, there was one attempted train robbery that was such a spectacular failure that I had to share it with you. It comes from the Arizona Republican in February of 1895. The article starts by saying that, quote, in all the history of train robbery, there was never anything so funny as the holdup of Southern Pacific Express number 20 at Stein's Pass on Monday night. According to Jackie Burke, the engineer, quote, when the robbers mounted the engine and directed the cutting loose from the train, everything was done with alacrity and strictly according to instructions. After running about three miles, the robbers ordered us stopped and handed him a bag, told him to get out and to fill it with stones and gravel. Mr. Burke began to suppose that he had fallen into the hands of escaped lunatics instead of train robbers. His curiosity prompted him to inquire, what's that for? The robber explained that the bag of gravel was to be placed on top of the safe to offer resistance to the dynamite. Confused, the engineer said, quote, we don't carry any safe in the cab. Do you mean the safe in the express car we abandoned three miles up the track? After remaining in, quote, silence and meditation for some time, the leader of the robbers, quote, damned everything about the Southern Pacific system. Every foot of the road was cursed from San Francisco to New Orleans. He then proceeded to curse the branch lines, the bridges, and the rolling stock, too. Quote, the robber wound up cursing himself and his associates, and there seemed nothing else to swear about without falling into the reprehensible habit of reiteration. The robbers then mounted their horses, which were hitched nearby, and rode off. By 1899, the Omaha Bee said it best. That quote, lead and hemp caused a slump in the business of train robbing. A decade earlier, most western states suffered one a month. During that time, Texas alone had five train robbing gangs operating simultaneously. Ten years later, Texas didn't have a single one. So what brought this about? Lots of factors. Trains increased security, law enforcement was more effective, robbers moved on to soft targets, and some states made train robbery a capital offense. When Arizona did so, the number of train robberies were cut in half. While it still continued into the early 1900s, the golden age of train robberies was fading fast. Yet, we're still in some ways entranced by its most notorious protagonists. Jesse James, Butch Cassidy, Rube Burrow, Kid Curry, Sam Bass, and others. All of whom gained a fortune robbing trains, but ultimately died by the gun. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure that you like and you subscribe, because why not? It's fun to subscribe. All right, see you folks later. Thanks for watching. Just gotta thank my gold tier patrons, Tyler Bioshock Rodriguez, Chasing Victory, Ashley Gertensen, Teddy Bad Boy, The Innocents, Drake Pliskin, Hurt and Wade, Comrade Krieger, Man vs. Moose, Dawson E, and I Disappoint My Dad. Also want to thank my silver tier and my bronze tier patrons as well. Couldn't do this without all of your support. So thank you guys so much. Also want to make sure that I thank the Innocents, which is the Red Dead posse that I'm a part of, but a lot of those people on their own went out and did a whole bunch of research on this for me, testing in-game theories, riding around and getting footage. So thank you so much to the Innocents. If you guys want to know more about that Red Dead posse, I'll put some links down in the description. All right, thank you folks.